hi, everyone. And then you say hi back to me. There we go. That's how we started off. Uh, my name's Alexander, and I have the privilege of working on the curatorial staff at the Welland Museum of Art. And it is our privilege uh, to be hosting Jamia Richmond Edwards on campus this week. Uh, she is here as one of our visiting artists for the show that is currently on view at the Welland. That is Dialogues Across Disciplines, which I co-curated with our director, Tracy Adler. Um, a few things, uh, just housekeeping wise, before we get started, you are gonna have a chance to ask questions. So save those up uh, for the end. And that includes if you are one of our people uh, tuning in on Zoom, uh, go ahead and submit those questions through the Q&A chat. Thank you, Amy Sylvester, my colleague, for monitoring that chat. Also, if you're here as part of Professor Brenner's class, don't forget to sign in with her or make eye contact in some way so she knows that you're here. Uh, Jamia Richmond Edwards makes paintings and collages that are deeply rooted in her upbringing in Detroit, Michigan. A pursuit of a BFA took her to Mississippi and Jackson State University, uh, where her family has roots. Uh, and I believe she uh, still owns some land back in Mississippi as well. And then uh, she went on to pursue her MFA, which took her to Howard University and the DMV area around Washington, DC. She was there for about 13 years and then has just recently moved back to the Motor City. Um, and so she'll have a lot to say about Detroit and the influence that Detroit has had on her work. But even more so, I think you can find that a lot of her work is very female-centric and you can find a lot of influences in her work based on the strong women in her life, uh, her grandmother, her mother, and her sister. And even though those influences are highly personal, I think you can read her larger body of work uh, as a fascinating exploration of black and indigenous womanhood in the United States of America today. We've had lots of conversations with classes already on her first day. Uh, at Hamilton, and we've talked a lot about how her work very importantly challenges some of our um, uh, traditional notions of high versus low art, of craft versus fine art, of expressiveness and uh, versus refined uh, art making. And I think you're gonna uh, have a chance to dive into um, some of those dichotomies uh, with her work. As I said, you will have time to ask questions, save those up for the end, but for right now, please help me welcome Jamia Richmond Edwards. Testing, okay. How you all doing, y'all okay? All righty, all right, let's, let's, let's keep the show on the road. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm gonna do some walking around for you or if I'm gonna be stationary, so you know, we gonna work it out. Um, all right, so let's get it. Um, so before um, we really get into the work, I would like to um, kind of introduce to you guys the culture that's really informed um, how I think about art um, the way that I do. And um, I'm going to start off by stating that I guess this gap could be this way. Okay. Um, I was born in 1982, so the 80s was a really interesting time in America. Um, you had Reaganomics. Um, this was the 80s. You had the crack epidemic um, that really um, ripped through urban communities across America. Um, and you had the AIDS epidemic that was really, you know, um, that was alive and well in the 80s. So. Growing up in that era really um, informed a lot of my um, a lot of my inquiry because I was just really confused. Um, there was a huge juxtaposition of like how I thought about my family and how beautiful my family was um, or is not was but is, and the stark juxtaposition of of watching my community literally um, kind of get destroyed. So um, a lot of what's driven my process is really trying to find the beauty, trying to understand the beauty. And um, the, we're gonna look at the evolution of my process. And as you witness the evolution of my process, it's really um, indicative of me 
understanding myself, the world, America better. So um, to your left, you see the Notorious B.I.G. So I graduated from high school in the year 2000. Um, so the 90s was a time, it was a very um, interesting time in hip hop culture. So I grew up on like Bad Boys, Diddy, Lil' Kim, you know. Um, and if you see, um, Notorious is wearing a Coogee sweater. And at the time, that was one of the like, most popular fashion trends of that era. And um, you will find that motif throughout my work. Um, so shout out to Notorious and also shout out to Bad Boys, right? Um, below Notorious, you see this beautiful woman with red hair. Detroit was also known as the hair capital. So um, a lot of the hairstyles are becoming popular again. Um, I saw like um, Cardi B wearing what we would call a sculptural ponytail. Um, but I talk about that because I didn't necessarily have to go to museums to understand art growing up. Um, I could literally walk outside my door and how, you know, seeing how people fashion their bodies, their hair were all, it's all a part of art, right? Um, for, okay. Yeah, right there. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple of videos because um, I wanna preface this before we really get into the work. So we're gonna start off with these brothers dancing. Um, so they're doing a style of dance called Chicago Stepping. You, um, Chicago Stepping is a social dance that's, um, it was founded in Chicago, but it's really um, a Midwest thing. Um, Detroit, we have what is called bopping and ballroom dancing. And my mom was a ballroom dancer. So I grew up in that culture. I would go um, to family friendly parties on the weekend and I watch my mother dance. I watch my family members dance. And I wanna show you guys this video um, just to give you, like, just to give you guys a little insight of like what I witnessed growing up. So we're gonna watch these brothers. Do a little hand dance. Two things that I want you guys to note or make observation of. For one, the brothers got moves. Okay, let's put that out there. Okay. Um, but second of all, look at the community. Everyone is dressed in white. It's a very themed party. So Detroit has what is called white parties, black parties, blue parties, red parties. Um, and so this is an example of like the community coordinating for an idea or a celebration. So um, when you're looking at my work and people ask me like, well, why do you think about color the way that you do? This is what I grew up in, got it? All right. So this is the type of, like my mother, she's a like expert Chicago dancer, um, but this was kind of like my introduction to color. So before I even went to college, my color theory was community, okay? Um, the second thing that I wanna point out is, which is a heavy influence in my life are dancers. I told you my mom is a dancer. Um, I grew up in a family that are all dancers. I did dancing competitively from age nine to 18. Um, and from once I left Detroit, graduated from high school, I attended Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. And what's really amazing about that institution and that culture is I walked into a tradition that was, um, a very rich tradition that I wasn't really familiar with. But once I, you know, immerse myself within the culture, I'm like, okay, this feels familiar. So I'm just gonna give you an example of, um, I marched in a band. So just to give you guys context, um, I also played the instrument. I'm a French hornist. I played French horn from age nine to 21. So I look at myself as very Renaissance, um, fine art, music, dance. I, you know, I do all of that. Um, and I realized that Dancers are a major influence in my work. And I'm gonna show you guys this. 
And this is um, Jackson State University dance team. And these girls are doing major redding, major red. They, they're called the J sets. So if you guys are ever curious about where like Beyonce gets her swag and her moves from, it's historical black colleges. Um, so I wanted to show this. So here it is again in my life, kind of walking into a level of uniformity, right? So here I am a band member marching in a band, this idea of uniformity. Um, and then the sort of, um, obviously the movement of the women, right? It's both seductive, very strong. Um, and that was very inspiring for me. All right, we don't have to watch the full video, although, sorry. Um, and, and last but not least, um, this just give you, this is an ode to just the opulence of the 90s, 80s and 90s, the culture, minks, fur coats, fur coats, shell toes, bamboo earrings. That's how I grew up. So this is just the preface, the fine art, right? So um, I wanna start off with this piece um, titled Wings Not Meant to Fly. And I did this while I was in graduate school at Howard University. Um, this piece was very integral to my practice because to me, this is one of my, um, a, one, a very successful piece that was inspired by my aunt who was murdered um, in 2007. And um, she was murdered in Detroit. She was a former drug addict. And, you know, um, it was a pretty gruesome murder. And it happened in 2007. And I, did, I wasn't ready to deal with it until 2011. So I my graduate school work was really the start of my practice was really about me dealing with the trauma of that. Um, and what's interesting about this piece, this was a, a very integral piece um, that was part of the TV show Empire that was on it, with, with Lucius and a family and a cookie. Um, and this was fascinating is this painting was almost on every episode from start to finish. It was like the central piece in the home of, um, Lucius. And so, you know, that was really dope because coming from Detroit, I think about like luxury, opulence, um, swag. And here it is. This is a piece that I did in honor of my aunt, um, which is called Wings Not Meant to Fly, that was in this household on television that everybody was tuning into that's kind of um, introduced Black audiences to my work in a very luxurious context because empire represent, you know, this family making moves together. Um, so, and I titled it Wings Not Meant to Fly because, um, you know, again, dealing with my aunt, um, you know, not bir all birds aren't, aren't meant to fly, right? And so, you know, I was challenging that, like, well, am I, as a, as, if I'm looking at that as an analogy, am I supposed to fly? Like, does the world expect me to fly, right? Um, and I'm gonna try to just skate through a lot of things. Um, so, so going from this work, it was a little more on the monotone side. And so now I'm beginning to expand in color. This was around 2017. And notice that Kuji sweater I was telling you guys about. You see how it's appearing in the work. So um, um, this body of work, I, um, show this work in New York, and I wanted to deal with the material culture growing up in Detroit, and I was really fascinated by booster culture. Are you guys familiar with boosting, boosting culture? Okay, so you probably, if you watch Sex in the City, there's the episode where um, the girls wanted to get some, like, Louis Vuitton purses, and so they went to the, the black market in New York. Um, what's the area? I forget the name of the area where you buy the bootleg for, yes, Canal. <laughs> um, and so, I was just really thinking about um, just growing up in Detroit and 
how, again, this is a very fashionable city and what did it mean or what did it look like to secure what we call aesthetics or beauty, right? And sometimes you do it by hook or crook, right? Sometimes it's bootleg. The booster was a person who, um, like I had a, an acquaintance who father would, who would literally fly to China and bring back fake Louis Vuitton bags and sell them out his living room. And then you had the people who was just straight up stealing, right? Um, and it's like, how American is that, right? Like, let's, let's keep it real. So, um, you know, I created the work about that. Um, archetype of a five-star, this was um, inspired by Trina, five-star chick. If, you know, Trina is a rapper based in Miami, and this is me thinking about like, well, what is a five-star chick? I'm a five-star chick, okay? Um, <laughs> and so um, there's this constant conversation between me and pop culture and the world, right? Like, how is it that, you know, how what I view like the black community as being very insular, but I'm in Germany or West Africa and I see the cultural influence. So, um, you know, this is me being extremely intentional about um, just thinking about my upbringing and giving it, um, uh, what do you call it, credence, right? Like it, it, a lot of times it's just dismissive. Like, you know, I grew up looking at, uh, watching Nickelodeon and Fraggle Rock and I'm realizing like, this work is giving me Fraggle Rock vibes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tying it, it's, it's all related. Um, and notice throughout the work, the work is, you know, going from here, it's clean, you know, and then it's begin, becoming a lot more abstract. Um, Girl with two orbs, in my talks earlier, I mentioned when I first started including orbs in my work and the orbs were introduced to my work by my mother's UFO encounter, literally a UFO encounter that she had. And right immediately after she told me about this, um, this encounter, um, I started having orb encounters. And what I mean by orb encounters, I mean just chilling outside, looking up in the sky and seeing these circular things in the sky. Like, did anybody see that? Um, so I decided like, you know what, I'm gonna bring you in my artwork because you must be there for a reason. Um, one of the things that really inspired me when my mom had her encounter, she said, you know, I think this is a guardian angel. So I took that like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling that, right? Um, and historically throughout our history, you will find orbs, every, like it's, it's a circle, right? It's, it's everywhere. So um, within this work, like, it's kind of hidden, you have orbs hidden, but these are, my work is essentially me just trying to figure out things in my mind, right? Um, um, another, excuse me, inspiration for my work is, again, growing up in Detroit, girl in urban oasis, and this is inspired by my family. My grandfather had, Cassell Richmond had a bread company called Best Made, um, and he owned a diamond business, and he owned a bread distribution company. So um, I was thinking of Urban Oasis because throughout history, you discover that um, you've had these bustling um, Black towns historically that were disrupted or obscured in history, right? And so... This is me placing myself within this um, like idolized um, landscape where my family's businesses are like thriving. Um, Notice in the work, this it wasn't really overt, but it was there's a, a serpent that's and you, as the work evolves, you're going to see. But um, now, as I'm reflecting, you begin to see like introductions of ideas that, that appears in my work. Um, although I'm working very representational, my work is, I, it's still, it's very abstract, you know? And I feel the abstraction is building from um, my mentors at um, both Howard University and just artists who um, mentored me over the years, but my mentors at Howard University were part of Afro Cobra. And those of you who, um, 
definitely look into Afrocobra. They were um, a black arts group that um, began in the 60s. And um, one of the um, one of their philosophies, they had a whole manifesto, this group, and they were just like the colors had to be like Kool-Aid colors and had to resonate with the people. And um, I remember seeing that their work, um, Jeff Donaldson work when I was in undergrad and being really inspired. And at that moment, just really kind of chasing that, this aesthetic of like, I want my works to be really vibrant. And again, like looking at my work, it's giving me um, like yo MTV raps, you know what I mean? 80s, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so, oh, um, Two Sisters and the Horned Serpent. And um, this is a show that was, that I had um, called Seven Mile Girls, but notice the pink, this is a serpent. Um, and you you are you actually going to see how what the serpents um, transformed into. Uh, so um, yeah, one thing that I want you to make note of is anytime that I'm illustrating shoes or boots, there's the girls are always always depicted wearing alligators, and that's really um, alludes to. That um, Detroit was known as the Gator Capital, um, and I like to reference the Biggie Small songs where he states, um, "Stink Pink Gators, my Detroit players." Like that's all part of that that history. And so, again, I'll you know I always promise myself if I'm ever illustrating girls on, um, you know, on canvas, they're they're going to be super fly, and um, yeah. So seated girl with fringe pants and alligator. So at this point, when I did this piece, this is when I realized like I'm kind of work. These look like dance girls. <laughs> They're they look just like the majorettes. I, it took me it, literally into 2019 to make that connection. Been in band my whole life, and um, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a dancer. My mom a dancer. Is this a work about me? Is this about my family? Right. Um, these orbs are, you know, they're starting to appear more and more. They're taking on a whole element, a whole rhythm um, of their own. Slow dance with Big Chief. So I did a show in 2019 that was titled Prom Night. And um, so when I was in high school, I graduated in 2000. Um, prom culture is really huge in Detroit because how it was situated there, and I discover it's not like that everywhere. Um, we, our parents, so for prom, parents are understood, like you have to splurge, I need a rental car, and the dresses are always um, handmade, like they're customized. So by the time I was a freshman in high school, I knew that I'm gonna have prom. So I started designing my prom dress because I, I, I've, I've drawn and did art my, literally my whole life. Um, so I was drawing prom dresses by the time I was a freshman in high school and word got out. So I was designing a lot of the girls prom dresses in high school. So some would have an idea or they'll look through my sketchbook and they're like, OK, we'll get this made. So um, I that was a really large part of um, culture of the culture of Detroit. So in 2019, I was on social media and around the time of the Met um, Gala, you know, we all are going to look at the dresses to see who wore what. And I noticed that the prom pictures were going viral. And I don't, have you guys seen how like young people are doing prom nowadays? It is, I noticed that they were like flyer than the people who are at the Met. So I'm just like, oh yeah, this is reminding me. Um, so I started creating work inspired by these young people who were really like taking it to the next level. Um, one of the big things in prom culture is um, like the young men and women are seated at thrones. So I'm just like, wait a minute, this is very, you know, this is um, unlocking something for me as I'm looking at this. And I'm like, this this is all royalty. There's something going on with here. This, this feels like 
um, this feels like some, some nobility here. So I'm really, I, I became really intrigued by that. So I started um, replicating, like just drawing some of the, uh, the images that I was seeing and, and really placing young people, you know, on the throne because that's where they were placing themselves. So I was really inspired by that. Notice, you see the fringe. Um, I also noticed that my work, I'm extremely conservative. Like it's never a lot of skin showing. Um, and also make note of, at this point, I'm working in grayscale. The skin color is grayscale. And the hair is braided. Um, this was prom queen. So while I'm in my mind, when I first started doing this work, I'm like, oh yeah, this is all about prom. But then, oh, look what's emerging behind here, right? <laughs> so, and I'm seeing that, um, like, look what's emerging behind there because I'm unaware of it at the time. I, um, when I'm creating works, I'm essentially a vessel and the works are unfolding. When I start a painting, I'm really um, eager to see how it's gonna finish because I'm like, I don't know where this is going. Um, and so, you know, these, this, this snake is emerging and I'm just like, I just feel really um, compelled to create this. I don't understand why at this very moment, my work, um, it's far more advanced than me. So from here, I'm like, well, let me, let me explore this. Let's unpack this. And I discover how, how much um, these serpents, what we, I'm calling them horns, serpents are all throughout the Amer it, throughout America, the Americas, but particularly America, there's um, a mound in Ohio called Serpent Mound. It's one of the largest earthen mounds in the world, and it's a huge serpent. It's like really <laughs> exquisite. And um, I'm just like, okay, this is interesting. Um, I wasn't taught this. <laughs> um, so let's unpack this more. And as I began unpacking, I'm discovering that that motif is kind of all throughout the country. You find the horned serpent in indigenous culture. Um, I don't, I rarely do males in my work, but you know, every now and again, they pop up and this is prom Kang, not King, but Kang, okay. Um, uh, so this piece is titled Fly Girls and Fly Whips. And this is the girl sitting on top of the cars, looking super fly. And this is the community sending them off, all right? So I was really intrigued by this, um, like just black Americana, like why we do the things that we do, like what is that all about? And I realized that um, prom, um, you know, um, it's really a rite of passage for my community. And a lot of times, what I was discovering around this time was there were a lot of like, you know, articles written, like people were really angry about these young people posting on social media themselves, being regal, looking fly, because, you know, some of, it was an article written like, these poor kids should not be spending, all, you know, families shouldn't spend as much money on, um, on prom. Like, why would you waste all this money for this? And, you know, I was just like, well, wait a minute, when you see rituals globally, um, all throughout the world, do you question how much it costs to put on this ritual? You know what I mean? So um, I was a little annoyed at that, but then I started looking at it um, within the culture itself. There are many constraints, right? Um, and what I mean by constraints, I'm talking about like the construct that exists with blackness. And there's a lot of like finger wagging and respectability. But even within that box, I'm seeing a pattern of um, like culture, like we, we out here existing consistently, um, you know, regardless of the pressure. So, um, so notice I'm going from grayscale to color in 2020. And color's my girls, y'all. And this piece is called The Red Bone Who Can Make Rain and um, I did this at a residency in upstate New York, I, and I was like really mortified, like, oh, I'm in, I'm in color right now. What is this? Where is this leading me? And I was really unpacking that, like, why am I, why am I just now adding color to myself? 
up. And I realized, um, like really unpacking it, and this is before Rona hit, right? This is pre-Rona still, 2020, January 2020. And I realized that, like, wait a minute, this is really, um, this is really uh, representational of like me understanding myself. And for whatever reason in 2020, when 2020 hit, I became a lot more comfortable with myself. Um, and so I said, okay, this is me stepping into color. You know, I didn't, I, it was, I was really curious. Um, I'm like, where, you know, I don't know where this is going to go. Um, so the red bone who can make rain and a, have, have you guys heard the term red bone before? No. Okay. So red bone, I, I, when I first went down South in Mississippi, people call, were calling me red bone and I'm like, what is red bone? And red bone is somebody who has red skin, red features, red hair. And um, I'm just like, oh, okay. And people were asking me like, oh, are you Creole? Are you a red bone? And I'm like, what is a red bone? And then I discovered that red bone is a tribe. It's a tribe of folks who um, migrated from South Carolina up into Louisiana. And so when people saw me come down South with my long red flowing hair, they're like, oh, you, we know your type. So I was just like, okay, that's very interesting. So this is me. I'm some you guys getting a preview of my psyche, how I'm like, you know, working through these ideas. Um, so 2020 comes, no games played, and I create this piece. And it's like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> um, so growing up in Detroit, I grew up with like um my mom and my aunts and her friends, them playing, having card parties. And they were playing what we call bid whiz and spades, right? And what's really fascinating, what I discovered about like card culture within a black community, it derives from a divination system using cards, cardology, um, tarot, it's all kind of connected. Um, and that goes to, you know, at this point, I'm like actively making connections with like, oh, wait, okay, divination, community, this is, there's something to it. So, um, so I viewed this piece as um, my work started talking to me. I didn't quite understand what they were saying, right? They were, it, the subjects were like giving me codes and things and riddles to unpack. And even these cards right here was um, three, three, three. So a three of spades, three of diamonds, and three of clubs. Um, so I'm like, this is really interesting. At this point, Rona hadn't even hit yet. So um, to me, I feel like my work <laughs> was like the build up where these sisters are trying to tell me like, you know, it's about to go down. <laughs> because now rabbits started appearing in my work, right? Um, so I've never been intrigued by animals, really dismissive of animals, but yet they're appearing in the work. Okay. So now what I'm essentially saying is now, um, I'm becoming aware and now artists becomes seer. Okay. Some details and there ran alligator. Let me make sure. Yep, they ran alligator boots. Um, okay. So water ritual conjuring a horse serpent. At this point, Rona hit. And it's just like, okay, what's going on here? Um, my at this point, I felt like um, I was actively like going insane because at this point we are locked down and just like the world is ending. What is happening right now? You know, it was really weird. And um, I felt like my my subjects were doing rituals. They were doing things that I was extremely unfamiliar with, um, but I felt really compelled to make this work. And like, look how cool, this is a really cool piece because you can see the figure underneath the paper. Um, there is a serpent and it's water ritual conjuring a horned serpent. 
So I'm looking, so just imagine this as I'm beginning to look at the work almost like a graphic novel or a comic book, like each page is turning. So as I'm making the pieces, I'm like, oh, what's this horn serpent? What is it going to do? So let's see, let's see the journey it takes me on. Um, So this piece is one of, I feel like one of the most important pieces I've ever done because this is the first piece where I created a self-portrait. Can you guys spot me in the work piece? And this is me. And look at the position I decided to be in. I decided to be on my knees, kind of fixing her cloak. Um, and it really, it, it's, it was very jarring for me. I'm like, why? I don't want to draw myself. Why am I putting myself in this? And I feel like on the subconscious level, my work was just like, okay, girl, you locked in. You got to deal with yourself now. So, okay. Um, so the piece is titled Procession for the Return of the Ancient Ones. And um, I looked at this as like going back to the dance girls this look, these are girls in formation, right? And I'm like, you know, um, fixing a girl's cloak. But one thing I want to point, you know, typically the dance girls are, they're leading a procession for like the military, like historically, when we're looking at, you know, European military um, bands, or you just follow the history of um, marching bands, and again, I'm just like, I don't know who's behind them or who's in front of them, but they pause at this point. Like this scene is, is a very interesting scene that, you know, I did. And keep in mind when I'm working, I have no clue what's happening. I usually create the work and I'm sitting back like, okay, what's, what's happening here? Um, so that was a very integral piece. So this is, this is me right here. First time ever drawing myself since I was like 19. And my work is work that you have to experience in person because this is all texture. It's, it's so many like good stuff in the work. Lots of, um, you know, 3D components to the work. I'll be looking for time. It's cool. I, I'm gonna wrap it up real quick. Um, so at this point, I realized that the work was feeling a lot, a little rigid for me and they want, I wanted more movement. Then I started back painting. And I remember before, um, when I was in undergrad, I was an oil painter and I completely forgot about that. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I can still kind of paint. Um, cosmic memories and I'm just gonna shoot through it. Now I'm ready to do like a big self portrait and this piece is the mortal sister inspired by Medusa. So my thesis work at Howard University was called Medusa as an Archetype. And, um, and I was inspired by Medusa because I looked at the death of my aunt of, you know, the, 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 the men who murdered her, they saw her as, you know, disposable. And um, they saw her as this ugly being, but the truth of the matter is Medusa was a goddess. And um, I, I was really inspired by that. And so at this point, um, notice the snakes in the hair. So I'm taking on this archetype of this ugly, the archetype of Medusa, which is the ugly mother. Um, but then it's like, well, why is Medusa, why is she ugly? What's, why is she so angry? Then you discover the story, <laughs> you know, she was raped. Um, and so I'm kind of pushing back against these archetypes um, of like, well, maybe it's not a negative thing, right? And then I began looking at other interpretations of Medusa. And, it, you know, another interpretation is Medusa represents man or woman at their like most primal state of, of, um, of existence. So I'm like, I'm gonna take that energy, you know? Um, real quick, in search of move. Um, this is a really, a really lovely piece, but you see the the dark figure is making an appearance um, with alongside the figures in color. So um, if you guys are familiar with Mu, it's a, um, a mythological 
land mass um, that um, is often associated with Atlantis. So in search of Mu is like in search of this mythical space, ever notice the figure is pointing to the viewer, right? So I'm Atlantis, okay? Um, awakening of the sleeping dragon. Okay, interesting, right? So you have these three brothers who are standing on a mountain and this is a dragon head that I did. Never ever interested in dragons ever in my life. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is fascinating, right? Um, and now this, <laughs> this piece, this preceded this piece and these two pieces were created in my studio in Detroit, which at the time was a cathedral. It was a cathedral. So it had a major impact on my work. Um, so this piece was titled, This Water Runs Deep. And this is currently, it'll be view, on view at the Brooklyn Art Museum's um, early March. And it's a part of a group exhibition examining, um, is it 12, 13 artists, um, just looking at our, um, our family's relationship to the Great Migration. So here it is, this dragon appears biting its tail. And now keep in mind, I'm just, how, I'm just compelled to do this. And, and when I say compelled, I have to do it. Even if I'm like, I don't feel like doing it. It's something that's making me do this. Um, so one thing that I wanna make note of, um, so this is my mother, this is my husband, my sister Brandy, who was literally struck by lightning. She was struck by lightning uh, and survived. She's holding a lightning ball because I, I put my family in a gold boat. I know, she, my sister was struck by lightning. <laughs> this is my niece, my middle son, Yakalo, my eldest son, Jeremiah. And if you see right here, there is a dragon. And on top of the dragon is my youngest son, who's six, and my grandniece, who is, um, she's seven. They're flying on, they're flying on the dragon. So this is all dealing with like migration, family, genealogy, and um, notice what I noticed afterwards, looking at this piece is the dragon is literally emerging from my mother. It's coming from her. It's almost as if it's an extension of her, of us on this boat, right? Um, so now this is leading into I created this work, this latest work in October of, 20, of 2023. Um, and I'm gonna float through these real quick. This piece um, titled The Black Unicorn. So this is me moving back to Detroit. Like this is all work of me being in Detroit. And what's really fascinating about being in Detroit is when you look at the amazing architecture there, it's dragons and unicorns all throughout the architecture. So I'm literally responding to my environment. And I didn't realize I was until like after, like while I'm actively creating these pieces or <laughs> um, like after the fact. So I'm just like, I'm actually responding to my environment. Um, this piece is called The Fire Next Time. And this speaks on, this is a biblical reference. We heard, you know, the world was destroyed by water. The next time it will be fire. So um, this is me. Here's the dragon making an appearance. This is uh, my husband and I, my youngest son seated in his living room sort of setting. This is a dragon outside of a window. Just like he is wrecking hell on everything. And me and my husband are kind of like, we're chilling. And... I, this to me, this is just giving you an idea of like the world around me. It's just pure, to me, is just pure madness. I'm an empath, and this is me learning to like, I'm gonna let it go. I'm the 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 earth is going to earth, right? <laughs> so looking at this as a, a a meditation of letting go, um, there's a lot of elements that I'm bringing from being in Michigan, being in Detroit. Michigans are really plentiful. I mean, excuse me, cherries are very plentiful in Michigan. So I set them on the table. Corn is grown all throughout the Midwest. Um, there's a lot of tidbits. Um, this planet, this globe here is a Pangea. Um, and, you know, this is the maps, um, the theoretical maps of when the Earth was one landmass. So um, 
So you see the serpent in there, goodies up in here. Um, so this piece is titled, and I, and I can zoom it in some detail shots. Um, this piece is called "It's on Top of the Mount." The "It's on the Mountain Top" 2022, um, and in 2020 is when I had my first collective UFO encounter with my family, with my older sons, my goddaughters, and my nephew in Maryland. And we were outside for about four hours watching um, um, a cluster of UFOs fly around us, shooting blue lights, like it was a whole thing. So I was really inspired by that. And um, so I was really, um, before, so 2022, I went to Stone Mountain. This is actually Stone Mountain, Georgia. Um, and I envisioned, or again, now I'm giving myself permission to like create my own mythos, to create my own mythology. You know, I'm like, I'm writing my own epics and it's gonna be my style. So I decided to place that UFO encounter over the, um, and um, at, in front of this, at this landscape, right? Um, and so what's really fascinating about this place is when you look up Stone Mountain, Georgia, it has the largest um, uh, uh, mural dedicated to the KKK on the side of, the, of um, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Like if you Google it, it's there. And um, I thought that was really fascinating. And I just like, you know, forget that. We go put aliens on there. Instead, <laughs> I'm not scared of that. Um, and so then, if you see here, now here's this dragon kind of appearing. So in this piece, this is me in excitement, like, look up, it's there, it's, you see it. And so, um, and this is this is the um, this is the story that I'm like developing. Um. This piece is titled Naga, and I now I'm like at this point I'm really interested, like deep into uh, my research in terms of serpents. And if you trace it, if you keep tracing the um, these serpents, you'll find them all across the world. And in Hindu culture, you find the Nagas, which were the serpentine goddesses who were um, you know, responsible for like the creation of mankind. So I, I placed myself as a Naga. Because now the beauty about mythology and being the author of my own story, I can place myself wherever, you know? So I placed myself as a Naga. Um, Holy Wars. Um, and this is, again, this is me looking at, <laughs> the news, the world around me, and I'm just shaking my head like, mm -mm, y'all are just a mess, human beings. I have to paint about it. So um, this is, if you look back here, you'll see the volcano erupting and me and my crew, we have like these, um, this, these art, this archery of like, I don't know who we tearing up, but it's somebody, you know, it's the boogeyman, right? So, and finally, um, and I'm going to end right here, and I'll open it up for Q and A. Um, this piece is called um, "It's Not This Resurrection of the Dead; It's the Resurrection of the Dead." And this is me, like getting really deep into history, and. Um, I, throughout America, we have ancient mounds, mounds everywhere. And um, mounds are, um, they were built by, you know, what historically the Mississippian culture. And um, what's really fascinating when you like dig into the research of the mounds, um, many of them, and you'll find them in um, articles in, like, in the New York Times, like in the 1800s, they're discovering these skeletons, which are like seven to nine feet tall, buried at the foot of these mounds. And oftentimes they had double rows of teeth. 
And so this is me literally picking up like a skeleton with the double row teeth and me examining it. Um, and I'm looking at this as almost like this activation because this activation of me actively investigating history and placing myself within this history, which is really important to me as a Black Indigenous woman. You know, oftentimes um, I think that we are, you know, beheaded. I'm, I'm calling it a beheading because it's like, well, you were just a slave. That's it. And the reality is the history goes away. It's extremely ancient and um, extensive. And this is me acknowledging that. And so this is a really, a very special piece. Um, notice, and I didn't mention this, notice at this point of my practice, I am really using um, like fabrics. Like I'm, 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 the sculptural elements are becoming more grandiose. They are becoming larger. So I'm looking at it as these pieces physically want to come to life. They want to come off of the canvas. Um, and yeah, and as I'm, which is now because my pieces want to move around a little bit, I'm really intrigued um, by film. Um, really interested in the film, allowing my subjects to move and have life. Um, okay, that's it. Yeah, um, I don't make things easy for myself. I, I make my, I make life a lot stressful for myself. And um, I'm gonna be honest, there's a part of me that's really like completely just terrified of it. Like I'm known as, I'm a drawer. That's how the art world knows me. And now I feel, you know, inspired um, to paint. And, you know, I turned 40 last year, I'm 40. And what happened is, I was just like, you know what, boss up, Jamia. Do what you do. It is what it is. Own it, you know? And so, um, like, I worked through that anxiety of, like, are people going to understand it? Is it too weird? Um, to me, it's a, it's a sign of growth. And um, to me, it's a symbol of my courage, you know? And when I mean by courage, it's all about myself, you know? Um, <laughs> Is because it's a lot of fear. I'm fi I'm fighting myself consistently, um, and the question is like, why are you? What are you fighting? Why is that? Why is that a problem? And I think that um, what I'm working through, which I think a lot of us work through, um, you know, subconsciously, is just our natural way of being and wanting to exist in the world can be deemed as a problem right on whatever level and so this this my pro, my um practice is me actively standing 10 toes 10 toes down in myself in a belief in like how free are you Jamia? you know what i'm saying no one can grant me my freedom only i'm responsible of granting me my freedom and if i am too afraid to look in the mirror or express myself or say whatever I have to say, I have a bigger problem, let alone going outside in the world. You know, the world is going to world. It's going to do what it do. So my, my practice is literally about me just wanting to exist. And I found that the work allows me to exist and be in this world. So I really um, embrace the change. It really freaks me out. Um, what's really fascinating, I'm going to tell you how like amazing and ridiculous it is at the same time. I wrote 
an ama- I wrote a rap when I was in Baltimore a few months ago, and it was good. And I was in a bit, and my husband like really, and I'm like, one day I'm gonna rap this. Um, and I say that to say, <laughs> one day I'm going to do it, but I've crossed the threshold of like, I'm a, I'm gonna do whatever I want to do, <laughs> and that's when the work. It's really not about it, it. It exists outside of the art world. It it exists outside of the market. Now we're talking about again. This is like spiritual practice here. So um, this work is is a direct reflection of it's literally me working out the kinks of how I'm going to move in this world. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're gonna go back a little bit. Um, so this work first started appearing. This is where it first started, and um, I how I thought about it was like, are these feather? Are these? Um, is this like a mink coat? Is this a? You know, I didn't understand it. But I put it there, right? Um, and you know, they began to evolve within the work. So one of the things I realized, because there's always threads throughout history, and when you um, research the serpent, if you there, you will come across the feathered serpent. So what I'm realizing with the most recent body of work, I've become the Naga, I become the serpent. So I went from being just regular degular, just, you know, a subject to now be um, including serpents in the work. Now I'm morphing into the serpents. And um, now, and from the serpents, it's like Medusa. So like, what's going on with that? So I'm looking at these, um, these cloaks as, it's all it's it's kind of related to it. And if you look throughout history, art history, so particularly in Mayan art, um, I'm um marching band, so in marching band, there's a lot of club we wear capes in marching band. So um I'm just finding all these places where it's James Brown wore a clothes, okay? So like this is this is you know, low-key part of the culture. What's the thread of it, in in my opinion, it's it's a very long thread. And this is about how, you know, cultures are interacting, how we are adapting things, how we're adapting aesthetics, or um, we're bringing aesthetics with us globally. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I'm seeing it. Yes. Did you have? With the red, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like right to the end because, um, so how it like my work. I can make it quicker if I under if I if I sketched it out, you know, like that would make my life way simpler. But um, so let's just say with this particular piece, um, so I would add the subject, and I'll add you know the background, and then I'm, I'll just stare at the canvas like, what is something you need? What do you need? What are you? What do, what do I need to provide you to complete you? And what I how I view it as actively listening. I'm literally listening to like. What is it? What is it you need? And um, you know, this sister wanted to stand next to um, a white mannequin, you know, and so um, so it it involves a, just a it it you know the word is it's patience. It's a lot of patience that is required in this process, 
and it's it's the patience to like wait for the answers that I'm seeking or the patience to um to be disciplined is like my process requires a lot of discipline because that means that it this may lead me to a video of like watching Eartha Kid. Like I it may I may have to watch hours of Eartha Kid till I find what I'm looking for. That's how my process works. And keep in mind, I I I said my practice, I realized like artist as seer, right? So now I'm looking, now I'm trying to figure out like what 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 am I seeing? What is it that you want me to reveal? Um so it's just being patient to like, you know, are you gonna read this whole book on dragons? I don't want to, but I have to because it's that one piece of information that I'm seeking or even being here, I'm in the process of writing a proposal for um, a show that I'll be in later on in the year. And um, I was telling Alexander, like, I don't quite know what it, I, I have an idea, but I'm still seeking some information. And part of the clues that I'm looking for is even here <laughs> in Clinton, you know? Um, being in a museum space, looking at the architecture. So I'll, I'm looking at myself like, you know, Scooby doing a game. <laughs> cause I'm gonna be like, well, what you got on? What, what's that? You know, what I need to know, I need to know this cause I'm feeding this, um, this, this beast, this dragon, this idea um, that's trying to manifest and is looking for, cause I'm just, you know, I'm so, so much information out here. Um, so I just have to be patient to, to to, to get the reveal. So yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great question. It's, um, it's D, all of the above, including older paintings of mine that um, like I'll rip up. Um, I was an educator for 30 years. Um, secondary educator and each at the end of the year students would like trash bag you know trash their artwork I had friends who were art teachers and they had trash bags full of old you know work that, that their students did so I said give it to me so I'll, I still have these bags of but it's history as well that I'm including within this work and I'll collage those up I'm making papers I'm buying um, papers from paper stores or the art supply store. People are donating things to me. So it's um, it's a variety of elements. Um, sure. It's a great question. Um, you know, I fight to the end. So if it's an art pickup on Friday at 5 p.m., I complete the piece on Friday at 5 p.m. <laughs> my, my, you know, my poor art dealers, he's like, can I get a picture? I'm like, no, you'll get it when it gets there. <laughs> so that's part of the process. And let me tell you, right, right. It's getting picked up Friday at 5 PM. I'm going to intentionally stress myself out and really work like Thursday and stay and pull all nighters. So it's really interesting how like the, the stress and trauma is part of the process, you know, like we, um, but I, I was really intrigued by that. And so just think about it. Like when you're, um, or your research of those of you who are part of or Greek organizations, there's, you know, there's a rites of passage and oftentimes, and just indigenous culture or cultures all over the world, a lot of the rites of passage involves pain, right, of some sort. Um, and I'm realized like, oh, am I like creating this trauma and pain for myself to create these pieces, right? Which is it, so it's part of the process and or I'm calling it 
um, the rites of passage, the ritual to finish in the work. So it by time the the truck comes and pick up the work, I am like, I am I am done. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And I typically do not touch the paintings once. I'm, they're done. Um, I have one piece that I, I save, always save work for myself, and I created it about five years ago. And I want to add something. I want to work on it so bad. It, but something is preventing me from working on it. And I'm like, what is preventing me? I if I want to work on it, I want to work on it. But um, I have not um, mustered up the gumption to do that yet. So... great question um I'm making it it for myself because the paintings are essentially I call them prayers they're meditations so the process from start to finish there's a series of things that I'm working through within myself right it's a breakdown of what's going on internally um so I'm by, so by time they leave I'm just like I'm done with it that's the prayer I'm on to the next one. So it's, and because, yes, I am within the market, I am within the system, um, but that's when they leave within the works, when I'm creating them and they're in my space, they're in my temple, they're in my cathedral, they're, that's me handling, dealing with me. And once it's done, it's out of there. So I found a way to detach myself from, um, the mate the material, you know what I mean, and it's almost like like I have I have three sons, um, and I'm, my eldest is eighteen, living in New York, doing his thing. He moved away. He's a musician, but I liken it to that where like this is my my child, my baby, but I have to let him go, and live and do his thing in the world, right? And that's what my works are doing, and you know, oftentimes they're bringing joy to, and you know, sparking inspiration and inquiry in spaces like this. Um, so I'm, I look at it as being there, like I'm extremely blessed um, when the pieces are housed with like with really amazing custodians. And that's, I've been lucky that's been the case oftentimes. So it's, it's fine. Uh -oh. There it is. <laughs> Okay. And that's one of my best friends. So I'm like, you, if you're going to ask me that question. Okay, Toya. Um, um, so I, I'm a night worker. I work in the evening. So I have, I have children. I have three children at home and I have an amazing um, husband and I work, I have to work outside at home and I feel most comfortable when my children are asleep. And I'm like, okay, they're, they're okay. So I'm on a night shift and, um, I, yeah, I'm, that's my safe space, you know, and I'm looking at it as I call this my spiritual practice. So when I'm going to the studio, I'm going to church, you know, um, I'm letting it all out or I'm letting it all in. Right. And so, um, yeah, I hope I answered that question. That was, Yes, I listen to a lot of jazz, um, particularly as of lately, Alice Coltrane. I'm obsessed with Alice Coltrane. I'm obsessed with jazz. Um, my son is a, a jazz musician, and 
I've been really privileged to be in that space to see like the genius of jazz musicians is improv. Like, how are, how are you guys doing that? And I realized I'm doing a form of that in my studio. Um, I'm a, a Motown Detroit girl, so I'm listening to a lot of Motown. As of lately, Isley Brothers. Um, I'm, I haven't been listening to a lot of hippity hop. Like, I'm getting too old for the, I don't understand it as much anymore call it hippity hop um um so primarily jazz and um lots of jazz when I'm really like feeling um feeling myself I may listen to some techno you know but it plays a major it plays a major role um I listen to a lot of lectures and the beauty of I discovered a few years ago like how beneficial YouTube is because people who are like really nerdy and for instance like if I'm interested in unicorns there is somebody on the internet who is just like have hours and hours of lectures on unicorns and I I I'm just I'm just I just discovered that so 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 a lot of my um my studio practice is listening to lectures and audio books of like the Emerald Tablet and um, like a lot of um, ancient literature and stuff. So a variety of things. It's a brother had a, a question up here. Yes, I, I didn't want to miss it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I just think that what's what's happening in my work and my growth is is that I just want to get off the canvas, which is why I'm I'm working in film and um, like right now I'm really in intrigued by I, I want to do bronze bronzes, you know, I, it's I want to do it all, and I'm a crazy woman. I'm actually going to do it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I just it's it's like how far can I, how far can I fly? Like how wide can I stretch myself? And I'm really intrigued by this idea of self-actualization. You know, um, one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite philosophers by the name of Drake, um, he goes, um, it's a song, he says, you know, it's real when you are who you think you are, right? And ever since I was a kid, I'm like, oh, I'm the baddest drawer in here. I've always hung out with like around guys. I would be the only girl in the crew. And I have this idea in my mind, like be the best artist ever. So of course that's all <laughs> subjective and it's all about my measurements of what I determined, not the art world, but me. So I am like really intrigued with how far I can push it. And the more that I want to, the higher that I want to climb, these pieces are coming off the canvas. And so I have um, um, a solo show in December um, in, my, in Miami Mocha. And I'm like, really, I have no idea where this work is going to go. So it's, 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 yeah, it's coming off the canvas now. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Adeze, um, Adeze, what's Adeze last name? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry, Adeze. Uh, but she's there. She's super fly. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, well, um, oh, there's so many things. Um, so one is I'm interested in 4D. I'm interested in film, right? Um, so that's one. Um, two, I'm really interested in fashion, and I will be launching my own fashion line that's been in the works for really all my life. Like, let me keep it up. I have my all my sketchbooks from when I was 14, 15. So I'm like 
literally going back to the archives like okay this is needs to get made so um I'm 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 at this point man where I'm just like I just want to do whatever I want to do and I'm going I'm doing it so it's that um I'm becoming really ambitious with the work um and one of the things that I'm I feel like I coined this. I may have heard it somewhere, but I call it submitting to my genius, right? And allowing myself to really, um, to to allowing myself to be like, to become my wildest dreams, and like being committed to actualizing that this lifetime. So, it's going to lead me to a whole lot of places, y'all. <laughs> I don't. Um, I, it's I'm. We'll see. But yeah, definitely fashion, film, and really dope art. And I may become a rapper. I'm just saying. These rhymes coming to me. Um, 